Hey, it's Matt. Welcome back to the channel. Uh, if you're new, this is my 12 part flyover photography series where I'm journeying deep into the flyover country of the American heartland, exposing the unseen, scene by scene. So when I started out this 12 part series, we uh, made this sunset photo, and then I promised we would come together and work on it through the process of editing it and presenting it. So I thought we should spend some time walking through the whole process of making a photo together from start to finish uh, throughout the series. But uh, the winter's almost over, so it's time to work a little bit on that editing. But before you go, I also wanted to be sure you see the camera I'm giving away. So yes, before I lose you, I'm gonna be giving away this DSLR camera this tripod, this camera bag, a battery, the charger, everything you need to get started in a landscape photography kit. If you're interested in seeing the barn image from the thumbnail, that's gonna be a complex edit that I'll handle at this time in the video. This is your last reminder to subscribe if you wanna see the video where I captured that image. But first, we're gonna start out with the sunset image that we took in Kentucky. So you may be wondering, if this is a video about photo editing, why are we in the park? And I'll tell you, as someone who used to develop film for a living, I'm just as surprised as you are, but a great place to do photo editing is now whatever place you're in. Yeah, there's our sunset photo right there. Uh, sure, I could edit this on the computer, but it doesn't really benefit from that. So why not enjoy the spring environment and just handle the photo editing right on the phone? You know, a few years ago, this used to be a lot harder and really required a computer. So for example, we'd have to bracket the exposures to get a shot like this with the sun in it. Now, a single exposure from a modern camera can easily be edited in the phone. Also, the phone can handle the raw data directly instead of having to be re-encoded and compressed into a lower quality format like a JPEG image. So I'm gonna load the raw file directly from the camera. I'll show you what the JPEG would have looked like. So when the uh, camera automatically processes the JPEG, this is what it looks like. But we're going to do one better by pulling that image up in the, re the regular uh, iPhone Photos Editor. There's an equivalent editor for Android phones. So I made this at four exposures and I'm going to pull up the uh, third from the last exposure. That's the last one that's got some color in the sky. Let's go to the edit button. How's it going? You see it says raw at the top, so, so iOS is recognizing that this is a raw image file. And so what do I have to tell you about editing with apps like this? It's super easy. It's just made up of a bunch of sliders. You slide the slider one way and it looks worse, and you slide it the other way and it looks better. And you just go through and use these sliders until your image looks the way you want it to. That's exactly what I'm going to do. It may make your work faster or a little easier if you know what the sliders do and which slider you want to hit when. But honestly, this program can be written in Martian. You don't need to know what the sliders are. You just slide them around so your picture looks good. Like, am I crazy? It's easy, right? <laughs> uh, no need to overcomplicate it. So we'll raise the shadows on this image a little bit. Yeah, you can see how that's um, really showing off what extra data is, is captured in this raw file. Right, we'll lower the exposure some, lower the highlights. We can saturate the colors a little more and we're done. We got a picture that I like. Easy peasy. Okay, so now let's head back to my studio and pull up that barn image, which is an image that can benefit from some good computer processing. Well, I may have gotten lucky uh, capturing all that data in one file, but that's sort of the miracle of modern cameras. But I still recommend old cameras like this one I'm giving away as landscape photography cameras, both for beginners, and I actually enjoyed using it myself, even as an experienced photographer. Uh, they may not have super fast frame rates, you know, the processing might be a little slow, but that extra time dwelling with the image, I feel is always enjoyable, 
in the field and where they have shortcomings in terms of image quality, such as that limited dynamic range. Uh, when I pull this up on the computer and show you how we can overcome challenges like that, I think you're going to be saying, I wish I subscribed so I could find out how to win a camera like that for myself or a beginning photographer that I know. I bet someone who watches this channel is familiar with this name. This is perfect timing. If you think you know what this is, you might be right and you might be wrong, but there's only one way to find out for sure. I did clean off my desktop for this video, not this desktop, but this may not be the best barn scene around, but I was so excited to find it for reasons that shall be illuminated in a few weeks time if you subscribe to the channel. You'll see the on location video of creating this photograph. Yeah, as we saw in the video, I captured this at three different exposures and underexposure at a sixth of a second, a somewhat more median exposure at a third of a second, and what I would say is actually a proper exposure for the scene, though you can see here, this guy is completely blown out at a half a second. Um, so these, these first two images are about a stop apart. This last one is about two thirds of a stop from the others. So there are a lot of different programs you could use to do this sort of imaging on your computer. Uh, today I'm gonna show you the uh, Adobe Imaging Suite, which is gonna be Lightroom and Photoshop. Before we, even, before we even get into editing the images, we're already seeing one of the great advantages, which is uh, the uh, file management side. This is called a DAM or digital asset management. So Lightroom has got all of my images uh, ever <laughs> uh, in this one single library, which makes them not only easy to access, uh, but also easy to make the sorts of comparisons that I'm gonna make right now. All right, on to our barn. Let's, let's uh, zoom in on, on all the images, get them all at about the same spot. You may not realize it, but it's hugely advantageous to deal with the raw image data that's captured from the camera. And I'll show you why. While this image here looks completely blown out in the sky, this is the overexposure. If I just um, lower the exposure slider, and you can see that a lot of that detail is coming right back. The same thing with the underexposure. If you look here in the shadow areas, uh, here, like here next to the barn, for example, or in the barn, I can raise the exposure slider, right? And that data comes right back. But here's where it's useful to make the comparison. Uh, you notice here in the underexposure, it's uh, really noisy. That's because the we just simply provided the camera with less light, right? We only illuminated the sensor for a sixth of a second as opposed to a full half of a second. So the camera's sort of doing some guesswork here, whereas, on the overexposure, you get, we've got good crisp details in the barn and the grass and not a whole lot of noise. That, that's especially, uh, we get a good strong indication of that if we look down here at this corner. Notice here the image is nice and clean. Actually, let's go in four to one. Clean and detailed and, and it's just made up of crisp recognizable blaze of grass. If we go in four to one at the underexposure, we see that there's a lot of noise, it's really blocky. These artifacts especially show up in large prints. So conversely, looking over at the highlight areas, I'm gonna look at the most detailed part of the sky, even though like, like we said, we can bring that back by lowering the exposure, fairly approximately match the luminance values of these purple parts of the clouds here between the under and over exposures. You can see that even though they're approximately the same light values, there's a lot more detail and a smoother gradient in this part of the sky in the underexposure than in the overexposure. 
In fact, the colors are the colors have gone wacky. Uh, shades of green here, and there's less detail, and some of the image will remain completely white, even if we lower the exposure all the way. I'm going to reset all these now. So the median exposure, uh, truthfully, doesn't look terrible. I think that I could reasonably approximate just with the highlight and shadow sliders and the exposure slider and maybe a little contrast. And I, you know, I think I could make a passable image just using the median exposure, but I'm going to try to make a better than passable image by combining all three into a high dynamic range image. So I'll, let me just get these props. So I'll select all three images here in Lightroom and just go to Photo Merge and HDR. And I'll let Lightroom determine which parts of which image contain the most detail and merge them all into one digital negative file that contains all of the data across the entire range of luminous values. So I'll just select auto align because I don't know if you noticed, but there was a slight shift in the camera position between two of the exposures. So that's going to align all the images together and I'll hit photo merge. And then it's going to do a lot of smart work for me that I don't have to do. This could be done manually in Photoshop and sometimes it will look better that way. But uh, today I'm just going to show you something simple so we can get into more creative vice technical photo editing. And then uh, Adobe will automatically uh, create a stack of those three images here you see, and then the uh, merged image will be this digital negative file that we're looking at on top, the very top of the stack. And now you can see that these sliders are much more touchy. And if I move the exposure slider all the way down, there's still good detail in the sky. If I move it all the way up, still good noiseless detail in the foreground as well. So this has sort of compressed all the histogram down. If you have a look at the histogram here, you can see that all the data are compressed into a, this uh, small section of the histogram. And it's possible if we lower the highlight slider, raise the shadow slider, lower the contrast, it's possible to compress and display all the data even on a fairly limited display like this iMac monitor. Okay, so now we've got some technical stuff out of the way that's gonna give us a lot more flexibility to play with in this file. We can start having fun with it. Um, and Lightroom's got some like push button presets you can use that will sort of uh, can get you started. Um, right, and you, it's, I don't, I'm not especially familiar with this, but I mean, there you go, right? You're sliding the sliders around, you're pushing buttons, you're making your picture look better. Um, the starting point for me, I, there's an obvious, uh, so the most uh, glaringly obvious problem with this image to me is that it's not level. It always bothers me when images aren't level, but I'm gonna save that for last, okay? I just wanted to bring up, if, if, uh, if that's bothering you as well, don't worry, we will address that glaring problem later in the editing process. Uh, for now, I'm going to work on exposure and color. We're going to start with uh, luminance and presence. Uh, you can see there's an auto button. Why not, right? Boom, that looks better than it did. I think this is a little too effecty, but you know, regardless of whether I like that or not, I'm going to go through and then make adjustments to get, make it perfectly to my taste. So um, I might start by with the exposure slider. So I'm going to see, first I'm going to slide the exposure slider both ways and see what sort of latitude um, this high dynamic range image is giving us. This exposure for the foreground is actually pretty good. I know it appears dark. Um, this is gonna be a dark image. I'm just gonna lower the highlights. That's not low enough. Now I'm gonna lower the exposure some more. I'm gonna keep making adjustments like this that target luminance values until I feel like they've achieved sort of a balance point so that when I make global adjustments later, they'll sort of uh, work together. See, now this is at the sort of an appropriate balance so that I can 
just use the exposure slider to get all this stuff clicking. And then I can make even more targeted adjustments to, to address issues in certain parts of the image. So right now, this is about the exposure that I want in the foreground. Again, I know it appears dark, but that's the, that's the look I want to achieve with the image. Even with the foreground this dark, the sky is far too bright. So I can bring in a linear gradient filter like this and use uh, the range mask tool to only apply the adjustment to the bright parts of the image. Okay. And then make adjustments to this guy. There we go. Now we're looking, now we're cooking, right? I also sometimes don't mind if the sky is not too textured or too contrasty. And I can even use this dehaze slider to soften the appearance of the sky just a little bit. Moving the dehaze slider that way causes the picture to brighten. And then I'll lower those values back down with the exposure slider. See what we're doing here? Just making just addressing issues as they come up. Sometimes making a change in one aspect of the image will cause an issue in another part of the image, and we'll just keep moving these sliders around until it looks the way I like it. And I'm happy with where I've got this guy. I'll make a, another adjustment for the uh, foreground and our barn subject. common issue that I run into with sunset scenes like this is um, a clashy color contrast between the green grass and the sky. So I'll use a special adjustment just targeted towards the grass to adjust the hue so that it's a little matchier and then desaturate the grass slightly. This time I'll use a range mask that's targeted to the color of the grass. Shifting the grass towards the blue and desaturating it slightly helps it to jive a little more with that vibrant, warm color palette in the sky. And of course I can toggle these masks on and off to verify that I like the changes I've made. Now I'll apply a radial gradient to the barn. Again, I'll mask that gradient to the luminance values to make sure that it doesn't apply to the sky as well. I'll add a little light, lightness to the barn. Then I can use the brush tool if I like to add to that so that this path becomes a little brighter as well. And another little adjustment I like to add just into the foreground to give a subtle invitation to the scene is to lift the white values in the foreground. So sliding this white slider to the right, especially if you look down here in the grasses here, let's, well, I won't. Uh, especially if you look down here in the grasses, will uh, lift the values that are towards the white end. And also I'll, I'll use the highlights as well. I can lower the blacks and the uh, clarity slider is also a uh, contrast that's really targeted towards the whites. So you can watch those, the whites lift and fall as I raise and lower the clarity slider. So I will add a slight amount of clarity, maybe five here in the foreground. And then that effect is too amplified in the path. So once again, I will um, just use the brush tool and set it to erase this time. And just erase that adjustment from the path, right? I already brightened the path with that previous adjustment. So it's not necessary to, uh, to apply that just uh, adjustment to apply another lightning adjustment to the path. And then 
Uh, I mentioned uh, when I was on scene recording this that uh, because this isn't a super sharp lens, uh, I may do some work to sort of hide some of the detail areas that wouldn't come through well in the image. Um, oh, sorry for the noise of this stool. <laughs> you would think a drum stool would be quieter, but it's not. Um, but I actually haven't found that to be necessary. I've been really impressed with what the detail level that the kit lens captured on the scene. Um, it's been a long time since I used a Canon 18 to 55 kit lens. I think actually the one I used back when I started out with DSLRs was a 22 to 55, but uh, this lens performed surprisingly well for me. So I'm not gonna try to, so I'm not gonna do anything to try to distract from areas that should be detailed but aren't. I got good detail on the image. Um, I'm actually very happy with the detail that I captured in the barn, in the uh, foreground. I shot this at f16, so a little diffraction uh, in the uh, trees in the back, but uh, nothing nothing to ruin this image. I'd still put it on the wall. What else went here? So I think just maybe a slightly more contrast overall. It's always nice when I can make a global adjustment that affects the whole image. I'd like to bring this uh, corner. I think of this as like a leaky corner. It's too bright. <laughs> uh, all the interest is leaking out of the corner. So I'm going to, going to uh, I hate to darken it too much and bring a lot of gray tones in there. So I'm going to take some of the detail out and then I should be able to darken it a little more safely. And then, you know, I can saturate it as well. And I can also uh, shift the color profile uh, towards the blue and that'll lower those values as well as it deepens those blues. So that's, um, that's better than it was. And all right, now we'll fix the level on this, but, um, this is sort of a special case for level. I won't just level the horizon because there's also this barn and you can see that I wasn't shooting it straight onto the barn. So there's going to be a slight perspectival problem with it. So I will use, um, the special transform tool panel in Lightroom to, make the barn square. And I'll just use the lines in the barn to uh, align, to set up a set of uprights and tell, tell Lightroom what should be square in the image. And it will automatically make all the necessary transforms to make the barn square as if I were shooting it straight on. It's gonna transform the image perspectively sort of like this or like this. Um, it's just gonna do whatever's necessary. Then I can go to the cropping tool, use the, um, the angle tool here, uh, right across the one of the barn lines and there we go. So now the, now the image is both square and level. Um, and that the uh, perspective change has actually caused the barn to sort of stretch out horizontally. And we'll address that issue later when we bring the image into Photoshop to do some more advanced transforms on it. Cool, so now let's do some creative stuff. What's been bothering me about this image? A lot of debris out in this field, right? So we're gonna squint here really close and just use the um, cloning tool to get rid of some of this trash and debris around the scene. Just clean it up a little bit. All right, something else creative that I thought that might be fun is, let's turn on this barn light. Why not, right? Again, this is more editing than I would normally do, but let's just kind of show off what's possible with these programs. I'll zoom in four to one on the light. That'll, oh, don't do that. <laughs> That'll let me get a good, accurate uh, pinpoint on this. Again, we invert these radial filters when we want to work inside of them. This one was already set up to raise the exposure. Cool, that's pretty much what we want. And then maybe I'll um, also warm it up. Really easy to manipulate color in these raw files. And then what's so good with this HDR file, normally uh, an adjustment like this would have just blown it out to pure white but because we had all that data, all that detail data stacked across those luminance values. I was able to, I'm able to take this com several stops underexposed and several stops overexposed and still be able to see the outline and the shape of the uh, of this uh, bulb. So let's make this super bright, right? Actually, I can look at this one-to-one -one now. Okay, that looks pretty good. Maybe about like that. 
and make it a little wider with the whites adjustment. Then let's put another filter here. Let's put another radial adjustment here. Let's take this one out of the sky. <laughs> This looks like a powerful little light, but I don't think it would light up the sky. Let's give it this kind of like ob ovate shape that you would expect from a, a light like this. And then um, that's a little overkill, isn't it? Again, we'll zoom out and just give it something realistic looking and we'll warm it up as well because we know these old lights put out a nice warm light, don't they? And then let's give it a little path where it would illuminate the ground. Maybe not quite that wide. Now we'll do a couple of final adjustments before we kick it over to Photoshop. These are adjustments that I feel like are most appropriate to save for the end. We'll sharpen the image. This can be a drag on the processing if you're working with a sharpened image. So I'll sharpen it right here at the end. Uh, this is a 12 megapixel file, so it can benefit from a lot of sharpening. Uh, I'll put it over an area, a good high contrast area with the uh, uh, magnification preview, hold down the option key on your Mac, probably something else on your PC, control, I don't know. Um, hold that down and uh, manipulate these sharpening sliders to get a, pre a black and white preview, which is super helpful. So I'm going for a big radius, small detail in an image like this because the detail sharpening will tend to magnify the noise uh, and the uh, radius will uh, enhance the outlines. For an old 12 megapixel sensor like this, that's the best you can hope for. Last but not least, I will add a slight vignette that accentuates the barn by darkening the area around it. Nothing at stream. Looks like we went minus 12. Minus 12 on the vignette. I think I can do better by this sky. I'm gonna put another. <laughs> I'm gonna put another adjustment on top of that adjustment in the corner that we did earlier, to really accentuate how blue that is. Again, sort of try to close that corner up, and maybe even another one. Why not? Right. Really seal that corner up so that we're not. Yeah, that's better. And here where the sun is peeking out uh, in this area, the sunset area behind the barn, let's really accentuate that with a special radial filter just for that area. Again, we'll invert it. We'll feather it all the way out so it blends in nicely. We'll reset it by double clicking the effect button. Now I'm going to um, use a luminance mask again, just to make sure that this adjustment only affects the sky and not the barn. By masking out the lower end, we'll brighten this part of the sky slightly. We'll make sure it's nice and warm because it's the sunset area, but not too warm. It's easy to go overboard with these things. We're trying to make subtle adjustments, okay? That might be just a little too warm. You can saturate it a little. This part of the sky, we wanna, this is like the dream part. We're gonna take these texture sliders to the negative.
So we've brightened this adjustment up, brightened it, warmed it, and made it softer and dreamier. Just to accentuate that that's where the sun lives in this scene, back behind our barn. So now we've created sort of a nice storytelling element to this scene. The sun setting behind the barn, the light on, beautiful sunset, the green foliage just coming in for spring, a little puddle here, right? Lots of little things to help you imagine a scene unfolding here, not just elements, but pieces of a story. And now we'll make those uh, final adjustments in Photoshop. by right-clicking it and going to Edit in Photoshop. In Photoshop, I'll show you both how to make those more advanced transforms that we can't quite do in Lightroom, um, but also how I'll sort of mark this image up for social media. So first, I'll just use the um, Scale Transform tool, unlock the width and height adjustment right here, the uh, width and height lock, and skinny this barn back up to its uh, more normal proportions. That's a, after making that adjustment, I can uh, crop the image down, crop out this empty part, and then, you know what, let's do a similar transform here on the sky. And then last, I'll use the cropping tool to get this into some four or five aspect ratios. And for these uh, social media presentations, I like to put my little signature logo on it as well. Um, I think I made this in a program called Canva, a mobile app called Canva, or maybe it was Procreate. Procreate Pocket, that was the app I used. Um, yeah, just swiping my finger along, and I think it looks pretty good. And uh, exported it with the transparency, and it just drops right on these images, so. Super easy. This will probably look good right down here in this nice dark corner. After I make and export a crop, I just um, undo it and then move on to the next crop and export it. So, so I think next I'll make a side by side of this, a swiperoo two panel. Uh, so for that, I will uh, crop it down to. So it's going to be two four by five. So I'll crop it down to eight by five again with the crop tool. I'll use that, um, switch the aspect ratio to 8 by 5 I'll have to do some deciding about what I want and don't want. And uh, then I can use the view and new guide layout to set out a guide layout that I can, just two columns, right, that can help me to align my selection. And then crop it. Oops, we'll move my, we'll just hide the signature. And export it <laughs> again. I typically go through this a lot faster if I'm not explaining it. This is not a especially time consuming part of my like social media sharing process. And I'll just drag the selection to the other side and crop it. So if you, the uh, if this doesn't if you're trying this based on watching me and it doesn't snap for you like that, you'll want to turn on the uh, snapper here to the view, snap, and then make sure it's set up to snap to the guides. Um, it should be set to that by default, but just in case it's not. And we go to export this one as well. Uh, I'll deselect it and then I'll make one in four by five aspect ratio that showcases the entire image. Another thing that I might do, um, is, I don't know if you've considered this, but if you're only, if I'm only doing the swipe through and I don't have that first uh, four by five crop that showcases the whole image, I wouldn't necessarily want the first thing that the uh, person that ex like experiences the image to see would be this crop with, you know, <laughs> this crop without the, this crop of the side of the barn and think that that's the whole post. So something I might do if the image is really right side dominant, which a lot of my images I find are, is uh, go into the transforms 
and uh, just flip the image horizontally so that the interest is on the left hand side. Um, but that, that's not the case today. Today I got a good 4x5 crap out of this to lead with, but if that weren't the case, um, that's something you might consider is making sure that you've got the, you know, all the interest on the leading side of the image. I'll go to the image size first, and uh, for this I usually set the width to 2000. And then I know that the height will need to be 2500. I'll go into the canvas and extend the canvas to be 2500 pixels high. So that'll give me a four by five aspect ratio. And then, and then all I gotta do is, uh, maybe I'll duplicate this layer to expand it to something more interesting and um, All right, so now I've got a slightly more interesting backdrop. Maybe if I get really fancy, I'll shrink this one down so that it's sort of uh, framed in and recenter it. Now I suppose if I wanted to, I could make a white layer to go between and sort of give it a nice little framing. Layer, new uh, fill layer, solid color, and then I'll uh, set the color up to white. All right, I'll put that between these two layers. Um, and then I'll so make a selection around that's, you know, roughly the same, uh, slightly larger than the image, and then I'll drag the selection, and again, the snap will let me put it right smack dab in the middle, and then if I create, sorry, this comes with the layer mask by default, so I'll delete that one and just add a new one. It'll automatically make that mask to the selection, and... Then I'll turn my signature back on and blow it up. And then I think I'll lower the transparency of the signature a little bit so it's not quite so uh, overwhelming. And then I'll do the same. I'll do the same for the uh, white border so that they sort of match in values. And then uh, I think this is neat how it is, but I'll also... Um, Blur out the uh, background layer so it's not quite as distracting, and I'll do I'll make some other adjustments on it as well, uh, flatten it out a little bit, um, and desaturate it so that uh, it doesn't steal the show and sort of draws attention to the. Uh, main image and then this is ready to go. And then I'll just airdrop all those over to my phone. Load them up in Instagram. Make sure that it looks right in that presentation. So it looks like in this one I want to um, make just a few adjustments with the um, with the Instagram editing app because it's like close and easily available to make sure that it looks good um, on the mobile phone screen presentation. And then uh, type our little message here. See this photo edited from start to finish on YouTube today and send it out. Okay, I've never made a video like this. I feel like that was a little rough. Uh, it was certainly long and maybe not the most interesting, uh, but it's a topic I promised I would approach it in a video sometime. So hopefully someone out there found some use for it. Okay, I promise that there's a really interesting story to how this image was made. Uh, this is your last reminder to subscribe so that you get the notification when that comes out and you catch all the rest of this winter series as it's being wrapped up. Actually, why don't I just take a second and give you a preview of what's coming up to the channel. This is your last reminder. I'll go ahead and get my first shot right here.
And don't forget, we're also gonna crack open this package from the great Adam Gibbs. So until then, keep an eye out and a foot warm.